Hey there, guys. Now, please remember to utilize the parts section below to skip to any part of interest. My name is Ben Ferriolo, and this is a simple video on how to do some of the things that I do every day in the seismic analysis program called Swarm, which, in my opinion, is the best seismic analysis program available for free. Yes, it is free and in the public domain. Do not let anyone tell you that you have to pay for it. First off, if you haven't already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided in the description box below, right under my email address if you're viewing this on YouTube. Now, if you're viewing this on my website, then <laughs> you already have the link. Now, this video will appear under the How To drop-down menu on the Swarm page. Remember, my website can assist you in finding, accessing, and analyzing seismic and GPS deformation data, can teach you about the many different plots and charts that people use, and also contains hundreds upon hundreds of plots dealing with a great many earthquake swarms and events. Here you see some spectrograms streaming in real time via directly from the seismic instruments themselves. This is considered near real time, I believe, since there's about a delay of about 10 seconds or so or something like that. Now many people on YouTube use this for their earthquake monitor live streams and data can be streamed directly through the program itself or past data can be downloaded via IRIS or another data center and then opened in this program. Now, if you wish to see how to download data, simply go to my other page in the how-to drop-down menu called Download Data. Now, this video will be about the different aspects of the Seismic Analysis Program Swarm. Please know, however, that there are still a few aspects of Swarm I am unfamiliar with. For example, the particle motion plots. I have no idea what they're even for, but who knows, maybe someday I will. But before I show you how to use this program, what is Swarm? First off, Swarm is similar to many professional seismic analysis programs that seismologists use every day to monitor volcanoes and tectonic hazard areas. It is for professionals, amateurs, and students. However, it's a little bit geared more towards amateurs and students. Now, Swarm has been out for many, many years already, but is just recently starting to become more popular for those who want to monitor volcanic and tectonic hazard areas from the comfort of their own home. For those who watch my videos and follow my research on my website, you know that this is the number one program that I use. Waves is another seismic program, but I basically only use that for cross-correlation when trying to find the likely epicenter of any given swarm or earthquake. Now, the program Swarm is, again, 100% free and in the public domain. Basically, nobody owns it. It is for our education and entertainment that this program was created. Yes for entertainment as well. This is the seismic program Swarm. It is amazing to analyze seismic data from seismic stations around the world via this program. If you want to be able to monitor volcanoes without actually having to get to the volcanoes and, you know, be a part of volcanology, which I suggest being a part of volcanology and seismology. That's what I want to do someday. But for others out there, we can have a lot of people monitoring volcanoes just from the comfort of their own home. Here's the about on the seismic program SWARM. SWARM stands for Seismic Wave Analysis, Real-Time Monitoring, volcanoes.usgs.gov. Notice it is not owned by anybody, but USGS and IRIS did make it. With uh, USGS developed it. Uh, I believe it was the Alaska Volcano Observatory, which is a part of the USGS. But I believe AVO did create this program. But there were contributions from ISTI and the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, IRIS. Now here's the download page for the program Swarm. Now before you do anything, make sure that you have a Java Runtime Environment, JRE, version 8 installed on the target system. Now I did not have it prior to using Swarm, and I tried using Swarm without it and it didn't really work. But I believe they do provide a link to that download. You can get the JRE from the official Java website. Just come to the USGS Swarm download page. Now, once you have installed Java Runtime Environment, if you do not have it already, then you can now download the actual Swarm file. The most recent version of Swarm will always be right here at the top, and they do come out with new versions from time to time. Also, if you wish to see a very in-depth explanation of how to use Swarm and the many different aspects, feel free to check out the user manual, which can be found under Documentation. Just go to the download page, click Documentation, and a PDF version of a Swarm user manual is available right here. Now, let's go to Vision Statement just real quick. Now, what is Swarm for? Swarm, Seismic Wave Analysis Real-Time Monitoring, is an application created to make easily accessible to the public, amateur seismologists and students in particular, the most used tools used in seismology to study and monitor seismic waves, which are spectrograms, seismograms, and spectra plots. Yet, they offer all the power and fine-tuning needed by scientists and professionals in this field. Guys, 
That is why this program is so powerful. I mean, it really is a powerful program for seismic analysis, guys. It really is. Because on one hand, it is very easy to use and quick to learn for those who want to learn it, like amateurs and students. But it has the power and the fine-tuning needed for actual professional analysis. No joke. It is amazing, guys. Whoever thought of this really is a genius and could have made a lot of money on it. And look, it's for free. Trust me, they could have made a lot of money on this program, guys, but they made it free all for us, for the public. Now let's go down just real quick. In addition to monitoring analysis functionality, Swarm also provides a batch of automation tools, blah, 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 learning tool tool. Yes, it is meant for us to learn, and trust me, it has helped me learn a lot. Swarm is a tool for analysis, monitoring, and public outreach of seismic data. A program that can be deployed quickly and effortlessly. A program completely operated through a graphical user interface, meaning you don't have to actually code anything. It's very easy to use. Swarm is not a collection of command line tools. It's not a clone of existing applications. And it's not a program requiring manual configuration, file editing, which thank God it's not, because that would make it much more difficult. Thank God. Here we are back at the Swarm download page. Simply click this file. It'll open a download tab. Simply click OK to save the file to your computer. Let it download, let it download. Shouldn't take that long at all. It's only, for me, it's only 22.8 megabytes. So it's not that big. And it is in .zip file. It has downloaded. So next, what you do is you go into your download files. Let's go to downloads. And pretty much I don't have to tell you what to do after this. Just go online and find 7-zip or some free unzipper program. I use 7-zip myself, but 7-zip is free, so that's why I use it. <laughs> But you just simply unzip this file. Once that is done, you open the actual Swarm file, which I have opened right here. And then just go down and click Swarm underline console. I already have Swarm open, so let's close it, shall we? Swarm underline console, double click. Then you'll notice a black box pops up. You got to leave that open while you're using the program, guys. That is how the program works. And notice Swarm 2.8.9 is open. It's been downloaded. So now that we have opened the seismic program Swarm, what should we do next? Well, we can either stream data live from the seismic instruments themselves, or we can open seismic data for analysis. So let's open the seismic data first, and I will get to streaming the data. If you wish to skip to that now, please utilize the parts section below. Now here's the Iris Data Select URL Builder, the main source that I use for the millions of data files that I have downloaded since discovering that these possibilities exist. Trust me, when I first found out all of this was possible, I was so excited and then a little bit frustrated afterwards. It took some days of so, a good amount of frustration to actually understand how to do this stuff because I pretty much had to teach myself how to use these programs. It has been many, many months since I started to understand how to do all this, so I'm very, very well versed now in finding seismic data all over the world. Again, I'm not going to show you how to access data in this video, but if you wish to see that now, just go to the how-to drop-down menu on my website and go to the download data page. We're going to use an earthquake swarm as an example. So, which earthquake swarm should we use? Now let's use the July 5th, 2018 Rapid Fire Earthquake Swarm near West Thumb Lake and Yellowstone Lake. By the way, this page can be found on my website. Simply go to the Seismic Events drop down menu and click the page West Thumb Yellowstone Energetic Swarms and it'll bring you to the main page where you can then go to the many different swarms and swarm pages via the different dates which detail almost all of the Rapid Fire Earthquake Swarms that have struck around West Thumb Lake and Yellowstone Lake at Yellowstone Caldera since 2014. So since we're going to use the July 5th event, let's go, let's see, I already know what it is. I remember if you want to see how to do this, just go to the data, download data page under the how to drop down menu. I'll show you how to access this data and how to find any data you want all around the globe. But for right now, I already know what I want. Well, T01 HZ. Let's see, it was for 2018. So we got to make sure we got 2018. Let's click, what was it, July, right? So that's seven. 7, go back to 0, 05, 2, 0, 6. I just want one day's worth of seismic data. 0, 0, make sure it's in mini seed format. I do not change the quality, the minimum length, the longest only, or authentication. I just make sure the format's in mini seed and make sure these parameters are set. They are. Let's click the download link, and the data has been downloaded. 
So here we are back in the Seismic Program Swarm. Now I'm going to show you the many things that I do while analyzing data each day. I do this probably hundreds of times a day, so it has become second nature to me. Well, some of the things in the Program Swarm. However, that being said, just know that there are still some things about the Seismic Program Swarm that I do not understand, and I will not show the options that I don't use, but if you wish to understand them, simply review the PDF manual for Swarm. That can be found on the Swarm download page under Documentation. Link to the Swarm download page is, of course, below this video. However, if you are viewing this on my website, all the links and parts will, of course, be right below the video. So let's check out the file that we downloaded for the July 5th, 2018 Rapid Fire Swarm at West Thumb Lake. For those who are following along with me, if you wish to open this file and do what I'm doing, please look at the links below. There is a long link that starts with service.iris.edu. Click it, and it will download the same link that you will see me open here in .mc format. Also, if your computer does not have a huge amount of memory or processing power, now you may only be able to view a day or two's worth of seismic data at one time. This has to do with the maximum heap size. So when analyzing data, just try to do only one or two days worth of data at a time, one station at a time. On my older computer, I was able to open multiple days worth of data from many stations at one time. Sadly, my newer computer only allows me to do a couple stations at a time, with only a maximum of a day or two of data. I do not know if it's possible to change the maximum heap size, so if you ever see an error message pop up, simply close out of the program and reopen it and try again. Then reopen the file that you were trying to analyze. I suggest you are only using .mseed files, but other files are accepted as well. Now let's open the file that we downloaded, shall we? Go to File, Open File. I'm going to go over here, I'm going to go find the most recent one, which is this one right here. That's what we want. Press open. Is a YLT. Let's see. YLT. Now you notice after you open a file, it will show right here. If it does not, after it's done loading, simply close the program and try again. Once in a while, there is a glitch. Now let's open up the helicorder, shall we? This is the Swarm helicorder. Looks very similar to the one the University of Utah uses for their seismograph stations at Yellowstone. I believe they do use a very similar program because the auto scaling of the helicorders versus the ones online are very similar. So I believe they do use the program Swarm or a program that is almost identical to the program Swarm. Very similar because you can tell it even looks the same. So I'm going to zoom in just real quick. Let's zoom in. Okay, so here are all the options. First off, I rarely ever use this option, but this will always make sure that this helicorder is always on top if you have multiple ones open. Next, we have the helicorder view settings right here. Let me pan this up and let me pan this down. Helicorder view settings, the X minutes. Notice down at the bottom, you have the amount of minutes on the helicorder. Notice that 30 minutes, total of 30 minutes. And we see right here, total of 30 minutes. You can change that. Let's change that to 60, shall we? Press OK. Notice it now changed it to 60 minutes instead of 30 minutes, but let's go back. Next is hours. How many hours are in this time frame right here? This is one day's worth of data, right? Well, what if I want to see 12 hours worth of data, a half a day, press OK. Notice it now shows only 12 hours vertically, where beforehand it showed 24 hours vertically. But this sometimes glitches out a little bit, so I'm just going to put it back to the way it was, 30 minutes at 24 hours. Zoom seconds, this is basically for the window that will pop up. Here, let me show you. Now there is an analysis window. Notice how I have a seismogram analysis window right here. Notice that? Well, right here, if you go back to helicorder view settings, you can change the zoom right here. Let's check 120 and notice you it will zoom out. But that is basically useless because right here, we do have magnifier glasses, which zoom in and zoom out and zoom in all the way in that much and plus if that's not enough that should be enough guys that should be enough for you but if that's not enough you can select the window like this and open it like that you can even select down to a millisecond look at that that is why i love the program swarm but i still i've been looking for programs better than swarm i cannot find it guys it is an amazing program giving you so many options now notice we have some arrows oh wait i don't think i finished guys now clipping has to do with the amplitude clippings. I never change any of this ever. 
The only thing I ever change in the helicopter view settings is X minutes, Y hours, and the view time, which will show the view time of the helicopter in question right here. Why isn't this working? There we go. Okay. So next we do see, let me go back. Whoops. Whoopsie. Right here we have the arrows. Notice we have the backward arrow. Scroll backwards in time. Scroll forwards in time. That's easy, obviously. But it can also be used with this. You can scroll forward in time with this. And it will keep scrolling forward until the data stops. And you have to press X again to make sure that it scrolls forward and backwards for the helicopter. Right here. Compress X axis and expand X axis. Compress Y axis and expand Y axis. These four options right here will change the same helicopter settings that, I, that you see right here. X minutes and Y hours. I suggest to leave these alone. I never use these. If I ever want to change any settings for the helicopters, I never use these four settings. I only use X minutes and Y hours and the view time. And that's it. So basically, I just use the helicopter settings, the two arrows, two magnifying glasses, of course. But what's this? We got something else. Wave settings. This one's a little bit more intricate. First, let's select an area, right? Let's select right here, interesting part of the swarm, right? So we got that set. Now let's go to wave settings. And by the way, you can have any one you want. These are the three plots that I use. This is a seismogram plot showing the strength, the amplitude, seismic frequency, and time period horizontally. Notice we have spectrogram, which shows frequency vertically, time period horizontally, and the color range that you see is power, which you will see in just a second. Here is a spectra plot, which shows power vertically and frequency horizontally. Does not show time period, so it'll show the power and the frequency of anything in the window that you have selected. But for now, let's just go to the wave view. First, here's wave settings. This is the second set of settings in the program swarm. Notice we have, this is just the view. This will just change the view. Notice if I change to spectra, it'll go to spectra. Notice if I go to spectrogram, it'll go to spectrogram. So let's go right here. Let's do the wave settings first. Now here's for the wave options for the seismogram plot. This will change the seismogram plot. I never remove bias or use calibrations. I, very rarely. Right now, I do do minimum amplitude and maximum amplitude. Right now, auto scale is on, persistent rescale is off. If you turn persistent rescale on, look at this. Notice how you see the activity is about 15,000, 16,000 or so. Go down here, it does not change. So, you, so you're gonna be zooming in and you're like, I can't see the smaller activity. This is what frustrated me the most when first starting out in the program swarm. I could not see the data that I wanted and I wondered why. Why is it cutting the amplitudes? Whatever the largest event is that is shown in this window, it, it remains that way. And so I can't see the smaller activity. Finally, I learned to keep persistent rescale unchecked. I highly suggest you do not have this checked. Make sure this is unchecked and auto scale is on. So that way, press OK. Notice how having auto scale on and persistent rescale unchecked, no matter what, no matter what, the maximum uh, amplitude of any given event is shown within the window. So nothing is cut, period. So let's go back. We can do manual scale if you want. Let's say I only wanted to see activity around 1000 amplitude count, no greater, right? So we click manual scale, we got 1000 amplitude count, minimum and maximum. Notice how right here is zero, maximum, minimum, press OK. Notice, it'll then only show anything within that 1,000 amplitude count range, both positive and negative. Remember, this is a short period vertical station, meaning that the data you see is vertical, meaning, let's zoom all the way in. Notice how this is going up. That is ground motion heading towards the surface. Now it's going down. That is ground motion heading down. Let's go back. Turn auto scale back on. Next is the spectra options, with, which actually frustrate me just a little bit. What I usually do for my spectra plots, if, if it's a low frequency event, I only uncheck log power. Of course, you could keep both these checked and have a traditional spectra plot. But I personally like the other ones better that show it this way. 
But usually I only do this for low frequency events between about one to five hertz. That's usually what I only use that for. Most of the time I have log frequency and log power unchecked. It'll show the power on the left, frequency range at the bottom horizontally, and you can see how strong each frequency was. It is similar to a spectrogram, except this does not show time period at all. Let's, uh, okay, uh-oh, I forgot, guys, I forgot. I have a warning. Notice how I have both these unchecked. Well, let's go to the spectrogram plot, right? Oh my god, what happened to the data? What the heck happened to the data? For some reason, look when I check these two, watch. Boom, it goes back to normal. This is what it should look like. This is what a spectrogram should look like. It should not look like this, ever. And I mean ever. I don't know why, guys, but if you have log power unchecked and you go to the spectrogram plot, it will corrupt the data. The data itself isn't actually corrupted, it's just how it looks. Simply press log power on and it will fix your problem. I don't know why this would even be at all connected to the spectrogram. Why would anyone want it to look like this at all? There's no reason for it. There's no reason for it. Someday, I hope the Swarm developers do get rid of that. Not get rid of the log power option, but get rid of the fact that it affects the spectrogram in such a terrible way. So now that we're on the spectrogram right here, let's show you some of these settings for the spectrogram plot. Notice we can set the range, notice frequency range right here, 0 hertz to 25 hertz. Notice you could change the minimum frequency and the maximum frequency, which I believe if you do change these two options, minimum frequency and maximum frequency, it also changes it for the spectra. Let's check it out. 10 hertz to 25 hertz. Notice how it'll only show activity at 10 hertz to 25 hertz. If you go to the spectra plot, log power, log frequency off, you will notice it only starts with 10 hertz and goes to 25 hertz. So it does look like the spectro, here, let me just go back to zero. The spectra plots and the spectrogram plots look like they are connected. I wish they weren't. I wish they were separated and had their own set of settings. I don't know why they even had them connected at all in that way, but now usually you will see overlap is set to 86 originally, but I have it automatically set to 95. This will make here, let me show you. Let's go back to the spectrogram. Let's set, let's do something really low. Let's do 50, right? Let's set overlap to 50. Man, that looks pixely, doesn't it? That doesn't look too good. Of course, that could be used for data. Of course, you, you guys could use that for analysis. You can get some good, accurate data with that. Uh, but let's go to 95, which is the maximum number. Look, if you try to do 96, it will not allow you. You can only do 95. Notice it makes everything much more smooth, which is a lot better when looking at very in-depth detail. So we're done with that. Window size, I never change. FFT points, I never change. But the power, I never change this at all. Usually it's set to 120. I have it set to 110. Doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but check this out. What if I do 90? Actually, you know what? Let's do 50, 20 to 50. Notice how it looks extreme. It looks extreme. Now let's go to 70. Now this is the power range in apparently in dB, which is decibels, the power range of the spectrogram. Notice how it looks a little bit weaker. This is not actually showing that the event is stronger. It's not manipulating the, manipulating the data at all. It is simply changing the way you see the data. Let's go back to 110. There we go. That looks normal. This is basically the normal spectrogram range. You could sometimes see it from 100. Let's go to 100. I, I think 100 to 120 is a good setting. It's automatically set to 120, so let's go to 120. Yeah, that's about the same. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So we just showed you the three different plots, seismogram, spectrogram, and spectra plots, and the settings associated with them in the seismic program swarm. Notice how you can manipulate anything. Anything you want. You can zoom in as much as you want to these spectrograms. You can go all the way to the seismogram plots and zoom in all the way. Or you could zoom all the way out or you could zoom all the way in. Yes, it's that amazing, guys. That is why I love this program. By the way, this is a very interesting earthquake swarm at Yellowstone. Very, very intriguing, by the way. The fourth type of plot is a particle motion plot. I have no idea. I'm going to be truthful with you guys right now. 
I have spent months trying to figure out how to even get this thing to work. I have no idea how to get it to work. So if you guys know how it works, please let me know. And here are the settings for the particle motion plots. But again, I don't use that. Now, here's something important. We have the Butterworth filter. This will set either a low pass filter, a high pass filter, or a band pass filter. Low pass will delete all frequencies above what you have set. For example, let's do the maximum frequency, which is what you edit for low pass. Let's set it to 5 hertz. Click OK. Let's go back to the spectrogram. Let's look at this right here. Notice how, uh-oh, whoops, I messed that one up. Let's, and remember, when you have the low pass, it automatically deletes it again. So if you open up the settings, you have to re-enter it in. Don't know why it's like that. I think that actually is a glitch. Click Enable. Make sure Enabled is checked. Click OK. OK. Now, it doesn't completely delete frequencies above 5 hertz. So notice how it says on the order of, and it's set to 4. Watch how this changes, changes right there. Let's go to the maximum frequency range of 5 again. Go to 8, to the 8th power. Boom! Notice how it's even stronger of a frequency filter, but it still does show a little bit above, going to about 7 hertz. So the frequency filters are not exact. It doesn't completely slice it off. It doesn't completely cut off the frequencies, but it mainly does. But that's what we need. I mean, it's doing exactly what it's meant to do, basically. So we have the low pass, which deletes all frequencies above the setting that we have set. Let's go to high pass and edit minimum frequency. This will delete all frequencies below a number that you have selected, making sure that the minimum frequency is the first frequency that you see, basically. Let's try 5 hertz for the minimum frequency for the high pass filter. Press OK. Notice it is opposite, now showing everything above 5 hertz. And this doesn't just affect spectrograms, guys. This affects all aspects of swarm. Notice how when I zoom in, Keep an eye on it, guys. Keep an eye on it. I'm going to turn enabled off. I'm going to press OK. Notice how it changed, right? Well, let me turn enabled on again. Boom. Notice how it changed. There, you can see frequencies and waveforms, guys. That's pretty much what it records as well. Now, the last one is a band pass filter. For this one, you have to edit minimum frequency and maximum frequency. For this one, let's do 10 hertz to 25 hertz. Press OK. Boom, this is what it looks like. Go to the spectrogram. Notice that we basically only see from 10 hertz to 25 hertz. That is how you filter the data. The main one that I use is usually only for broadband stations. Of course, I use these, all of them, sometimes. But mainly what I do with broadband stations, either BHZ or HHZ, HHG, anything that starts with an HH or a BH is a broadband station. And what I usually do is I set a high pass 0.8 hertz filter to the sixth power. That is usually what I do for a high pass filter. Again, 0.8 minimum frequency to the sixth power. Press OK. That is what I do to get rid of those pesky microseisms at times. And those are the settings for the seismic program swarm. This you can inset, uh, copy inset to the clipboard, but I usually don't do that. This option is very important. Notice right here, save heli quarter image. This will save, now this does not save the plots, guys. This does not save the seismogram, spectrogram, or spectra plots. This will only, and I mean only, see this? Only record the heli quarter. So let's save this. And remember again, always keep the height the way it is, unless you want to change it. I do sometimes change it. Keep the format to PNG. Always include channel. Again, always include channel. Let's set it to poo poo <laughs> png. Make sure it always says png at the end. Press save. Okay, we got that. Let's go to downloads. Do we have poo poo? Come on, poo poo. There's the real one. The older one didn't work. I don't know why, but here's poo poo. Did it save? Is it from YLT? Is it of the July 5th swarm? Yes, it is. Here it is right here. There's the earthquake swarm and there's the helicorder that we have saved. That is how I save my own helicorder through the seismic program swarm. Notice it does look completely professional. Doesn't even look like an amateur or someone like me even created it at all. Huh? Well, that's because I use the seismic program swarm and there's poo poo. That's poo poo for you. Let's go back to the program swarm. 
there's one last thing I want to let you guys know. You know how on the web recorders on Yellowstone now sometimes people say, oh, they're manipulating the data. And I used to be one of those people who said that. I thought they really were manipulating the data, making it look smaller when data would come in. That is called auto scale. It's so everything doesn't jump off the charts. But right here, you can change the scale. Whoa, where'd it go? Notice this scale right here. Whoa, that looks pretty extreme, doesn't it? Right there. Here, check it out. All the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And then let's go back. All the way up, all the way up, all the way up. You can manipulate it any way you want. Literally. But I do want you to be careful because there is not kind of a glitch. I think it just contradicts with each other. Press this. Boom. Notice how these turn red, right? Now, this is different. This will change the scale, but not of the amplitudes. This will change the scale of the amplitude cuttings. Notice how the scale remains the same, but the red marks, which are amplitude cuts, are gone. Now, here is what it looks like online, right? This is pretty much what it looks like on the online web recorders that they use for Yellowstone, right? Pretty much what it looks like. If you were to remove the amplitude cuttings, this is what it would look like. No joke. So what if there was harmonic or volcanic tremor occurring right here? You wouldn't see it. Or another earthquake occurring right here. You wouldn't see it. But you possibly would if it was cut down to here. Maybe. I don't know. But I'm just saying, you can completely remove If you don't like those red amplitude cuttings, you can completely remove it in the program swarm. Notice I just did it right here. And I also want you to notice, let's go back. Right here. Notice 6,000 amplitude count. I'm going to change the scale again. Notice how as I change the scale to small, much smaller, to much bigger, it doesn't change the actual amplitude count. Notice that. Smaller, bigger, but the amplitude count remains the same. That's because it is not manipulating the data, guys. And you should never use web recorders, online helicorders, or whatever. You should never use those only for your analysis, guys. Always use something like the program Swarm. Also, something else that is pretty nice is notice down here, It watch right here, right? It'll show you the exact time and date for both whatever you have set. I automatically have set Pacific Time for the left. Notice PDT, Pacific Time, and UTC on the right. That is what I like to have it set as, and it'll show both. Whatever you have set, it will show. Next, let's click a plot. Notice right here, always look down here, guys. Take a look right down at the bottom. Notice how it is showing the samples, how many samples per second, the date and the time of right here, what I have selected right here, right? And it also shows the maximum amplitude count and the minimum amplitude count. Go to the spectrogram. Notice right here, it'll show the, it's pretty much the same thing, but will show frequency instead, and it'll show you the exact frequency. Next, let me show you this. This is what I do all the time. Now, I, I want to see what the tallest frequency, the po most powerful frequency of this event was which would be the tallest spike right here. And I put my cursor right on the top of it and notice how it says 4.799756 hertz, or in other words, 4.8 hertz right there. So that is how I find out the specific frequencies of any given event, and that's that. One last thing, let's go up to File. This is another thing that I use sometimes. Let's go to File, let's click Options. This is in the third set of options. Use specific time zone, nah, use local machine time zone. This is for the left-hand side, I believe. It is referencing the left-hand side. The right-hand side is always in UTC. I believe it's always in UTC. Use instrument time zone if available. Duration magnitude. And if you enable this, you can select any earthquake and discover the actual magnitude. I have yet to understand how to do this. I still have a hard time doing this. I'm not going to show you how to do that now because really personally, I'm still learning that myself. SP distance, that's the distance between the P and S waves, I believe. And go down, go down. I do not use the map packs at all for the layout because sometimes you can stream data and kind of put the spectrograms on a map. Kind of looks cool, but I usually don't do that. Next one is large helicorder cursor. What does that mean? Let's click OK. Yeah, kind of. Uh, it's cool, though, because it's about the size of these three lines right here. Notice that. But it's kind of blocky, blotchy. A little bit. I don't know. In my opinion, it's a little 
a little too much. Just, I wish they, you know, I want to know what I wish they had. Multiple different types of cursors, which would be cool. But I like the simple T cursor. So that's it for that. So now that we have done that, let's talk about streaming live data in real time directly to the program swarm right from the seismic instruments themselves. In order to do this, you must first know which each network and station that you want. Now, each seismic station in the world is connected to a network. Each network can either have one station or thousands of stations. And each individual seismic station can have many different channels that record seismic data differently, even though it's just the one instrument. If you need an explanation on this, simply go to the How To drop down menu and go to the Download Data page. Watch the video on that page and you'll know how to understand network, station location, and channel codes. Now for this example, I want to use some data from the stations at Yellowstone. To start, notice how it says Iris right here. Well, if you haven't streamed data in Swarm yet, you will have to add the Iris stream just real quick. It's simple. Here, check it out. So now we're trying to stream the data from the seismic program Swarm. Just going to close that real quick. You don't have to do that, but... All right, so I, you see I already have Iris here. I already have it added, but I'm going to show you how to add it if it's not already in this list. AVO is already there automatically, but here's Iris. See this right here? Click New Data Source. It'll open up this tab, New Data Source. You can add many different data sources from other places, but just for Iris, let's go to Seed Link Server. Notice IP address or host name rtsiris.washington.edu. Click that. Once you click that, do not change the port. Up here, enter Iris once it's selected, and then you would press OK. I already have done that. It will add Iris to the left right here. Once that is done, double click Iris and it will say opening. Now this, depending on your computer, I believe this will take a good two minutes to open. It'll take a little while, so I'm going to pause this and come back. For you, it'll be a second, but for me, it'll be like two minutes. I'll be back when it opens. Notice how it opened all and networks. Now you can do all if you want, but this will open every single station in the Iris network. Yeah, there's thousands of channels, guys. So for this one, you just want to do networks. Now in this example, I want to use some stations from Yellowstone. Notice how we have a bunch of networks here. Again, if you want to learn about all the networks and how to download data and learn about the stations within the networks or anything that has to do with this, just go to the uh, how to drop down menu, the download data page and watch that video. But for Yellowstone, WY, let's do WY network. Of course, there are some stations in the PB network there, but I just want to use WY right now. Let's do Maple Creek, shall we? A popular station, YMC. Drop it down. Notice we have EHE, EHN, or EHZ. Most of the time, just use EHZ or anything ending in Z. That's basically uh, what you just use for simple overview, but anything ending in E or anything ending in N shows horizontal ground motion while Z shows vertical ground motion. Okay, so let's click, just highlight it once. Don't double click it, you can if you want, but just highlight it once. Go down, notice these options down here. Now I'm first gonna show you how to stream individual stream. Select open real time wave. Select it once, it'll open this right here. You can zoom out only a couple times. I like to zoom out all the way. I believe it only lets you zoom out about three times or so, just for this one example. You can look at the seismic waveforms, stream the spectra plot, which it really isn't helpful much, but you can stream the spectrogram. Notice how it is live streaming, uh, and I believe it updates every 10 to 20 seconds or so. Uh, yeah, so that's the most recent data, guys. This is, let's see, it's 1.19 p.m. Pacific time, so that's right here. This is about 10 seconds behind, I believe. So we got the most recent data for YMC, and you could do this with as many channels, as many stations as you want. Let's go to the horizontal channel for the north-south direction. Go right here. Notice how it'll open another stream showing horizontal ground motion going from the north to the south. Here's the spectrogram view of that as well. Okay, so we just learned how to stream individual ones. Now, what, what about the online live streams on YouTube, like Spectronet? Well, he hasn't been around much because he was trying to scam people. Uh, but Kiwi Quakes is a very good option. I actually like the Kiwi Quakes International Spectros. He does the same thing. Many people do. So how do you do that? Well, 
Let's do YMC as an example, shall we? Here, let me zoom all the way out. There we go. Now we got the full screen view. Now notice YMC just highlighted again, but right down here, click wave to monitor. Notice that? Click wave to monitor. Oh, there we go. It'll say retrieving data. Now notice how it doesn't say there's any data. Now I'm going to expand this. I'm going to move this up. I'm going to try to get it as big as possible. Notice how it says no wave data. This is a glitch. Whenever you see it says no wave data, go to monitor options in the top left corner and change the time span. Let's click OK. Still not showing any wave data. I think it glitches when the time span is a little too short. What I like to do is 600 seconds or 10 minutes. Click OK. Notice it now works. This is 10 minutes worth of data from Seismic Station YMC. Left click to go to Spectra. Left click again. Or excuse me, not left click, right click. Do not take my word for it, guys. I meant right click. Notice we have a very large spectrogram. But this monitor is not meant for just one. Oh, no. Let's go to YMR HHZ. Wave to monitor. Let's wait a second. Click it twice to the spectrogram. Now let's go to YNM near Steamboat Geyser. Quick wave to monitor. Wait for it to open. Right click. Again, if I'm saying left click, don't believe me. It's right click. There we go. We got that. Some interesting background activity. I wonder if Steamboat erupted. I don't know if it has or not yet, but th that's looking pretty strong. But that's not what we're looking at today. Let's go to YWB, wave to monitor, wait for it to open, and right click twice to get to the spectrogram. Now let's go up. Let's add something from the PB network at Yellowstone. Borehole 208 is at Yellowstone Lake. Why don't we add borehole 208 right here? Notice how it has a huge amount of channels. Find EHZ, wave to monitor, wait for it to open, and right click twice to go to the spectrogram. And notice how you can add as many as you want. Let's just add some random short period boreholes, right? Wave to monitor. Let's go up. Let's select another one. Wave to monitor. Now you can have as many as you want on here, guys. You could have like 20, 30, even maybe even 40 of them if your computer allows it. And then right click twice. And notice we got all the streaming spectrograms from Yellowstone and two in some random locations. Notice it shows the channels right over here. Woo! All right, guys. So you just learned how to use the Seismic Program Swarm. I know it's very long and involved at first, and it may seem overwhelming. But once you get over that hump of about two to three days of frustration, it gets so much easier, and it's fun, guys. Trust me, I'm still having fun, and I've been doing this for months and months now, guys. It's very, very fun. Now, the next thing I want to show you real quick is how I make my custom plots. You know my three-plot images that contain seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots? Well, I'm going to show you how I create those right now. Let's quit out of this. Let's go all the way up. Close file. Clear cache. And let's see. Let's drop this. Go to file. Open file. Remember that file we downloaded earlier about the July 5th, 2018 rapid fire swarm near West Thumb and Yellowstone Lake? Here it is right here. Go back. Now, let me zoom in just real quick. Now, if you uh, visit my videos and my website and you see all these custom three-plot images showing seismogram, spectrogram, and spectra plots, you're probably wondering how do I generate those. Well, Swarm does not have an actual plot generator that can actually save those plots as an image, which sucks. I wish they did, but I found a way around it. This is what you do to create your own professional-looking charts. Let's do an example, shall we? Let's use, let's just do this earthquake up here as an example. I want to create a plot, right? Well, first off, make sure persistent rescale is unchecked and overlap is set to 95. Now, sometimes if it's set to 95, it can create tiny artifacts in the spectrogram, but it's really nothing major. But I like to have it set to 95 for the best detail possible. Persistent rescale off, so we're good on that. Next, look at your keyboard. Do you see a button uh, on the top row that says PRTSC? Press it once. Now, notice down here in my files, right here, I do have paint open. Notice that? I got two, three of them actually open here. Let me spread this out a little bit. 
And let's go to the first blank paint document right here. Now go up after you have pressed PRTC, PRTSC, excuse me, press paste. Notice it will paste exactly what was seen. Let's press crop. Let's get it exact as close as possible. Go over here, do that. Now once you have this selected perfectly at the lines, if you can, go up and press copy. Once you press copy, go to untitled paint, press paste. And there it is, folks. There's the first one. Now, let's do spectrogram. Press PRTSC once. Go to paint, press paste. Press crop. Go right here. Get right on the lines. Make sure it's right on the lines. Press copy. Go to the second paint page. Press paste. Select this. Move it down. There's that. Now let's go to the spectra plot. I like to use log power, log frequency off. I like to use this version right here. Press PRT, SC just once. Press paste, crop. Make sure it's right on the lines, guys. Right on the lines. Let's go right there. Press copy. Go to the second paint. Press paste. And select it and move it down. And voila. But we're missing something. We're missing any information that has to do with this. So, we're not, I mean, you can add anything. You can add the magnitudes, the depths, the dates, the channel. But right now, I'm just going to add the date and the channel, which is basically required for all the plots that I make. I have to have that on there. I'm OCD about it. Because if anyone's looking at this, they're going to be like, okay, I see the times. And the times are always in UTC. But what's the date? And what station was this from? Just in case if someone else out there wants to download the seismic data and look at what I looked at. Let's do 2018-07-05 for July 5th, 2018. Move, uh, let's move forward just a little bit. WY is the network code. YLT was the station code. 01 is the location code. And EHG was the channel code. And, you, you know, you can add many different things. Magnitudes, depths, say that it's filtered or unfiltered if you want. But right now, this is basically the most basic. And you will notice on all the plots on my website, I do have it set like this. Date, channel, magnitude, depths, and at the end, say if it's filtered or unfiltered if you want. And that is how I create my custom three plot images from the Seismic Program Swarm using the program Paint. Notice how it looks quite professional. It looks very interesting, guys. And remember, if you go to my website and see all the plots I create, know that I did this for every single one of those. All of the hundreds and hundreds of plots that I have on my website, this is exactly how I did it, guys. This is how I do my research. This is how I create the content for you guys who want to study earthquakes and see what they look like uh, as a waveform, you know, because there are many different ways to look at seismic data, guys, and these three plots are the three types of data sources that scientists and seismologists, volcanologists use all the time. And it's very professional, guys. This Seismic Program Swarm is very professional. It's easy for amateurs and students, but also gives you the ability to analyze seismic data just like the professionals do. Actually, I think the University of Utah uses Swarm or a program almost exactly like Swarm. So, this is why I love the Seismic Program Swarm, guys. Now that's it. Tell me what you think. Was this a good video? So guys, I know this video is pretty long, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed learning how to use the Seismic Program Swarm. Now this program gives you the ability to monitor volcanic and tectonic hazard areas from the comfort of your own home, either in real time or past data. Now you may be thinking that is cool, but maybe wondering why it matters if you don't know what certain earthquakes and concerning events look like. Well, I was in the same boat. However, many, many months ago, I had a great idea. I would research very thoroughly known volcanic signals. For example, if I was trying to monitor Yellowstone or other volcanic areas, I then would find the approximate date, time, and location of confirmed volcanic events. For example, low frequency earthquakes, low frequency harmonic and volcanic tremor, and other events as well. I then downloaded the data from the closest stations and studied them. I found that this was the best way to become acquainted with seismic events, looking at past confirmed events and comparing them to current events. Because of this, I have become familiar with the many different seismic events that can point to different processes. Of course, I still have a lot to learn and there are still many things I do not understand. But doing that helped me understand a lot more than if I were simply looking at the online webcorders saying everything is harmonic tremor. 
So hopefully all this gives you guys the ability to not just listen to what others have to say, but to actually confirm it for yourself. Because trust me, a lot of what people state about Yellowstone is simply not true. However, some of it is. For example, one of the swarms the professionals rarely talk about is the 2008-2009 dike intrusion of magma beneath Yellowstone Lake. This intrusion was extremely concerning and is the type of activity expected before future volcanic eruptions at Yellowstone. No, that is not just my take on the swarm, but the professionals as well. Just go to my website, go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, and click the 2008-2009 Yellowstone Swarm. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and feel free to visit my website, of course, if you aren't already here. The next video for you to watch would be the How to Download Seismic Data video, which is on my website under the How to drop-down menu on the Download Data page. I hope this helped all of you guys. And if you guys learn everything that I talked about in this video, you are basically set. Next thing to do is to learn how to download the data, which actually you probably should learn how to do first before using Swarm.